Welcome to everyone. I'm James Jensen, today's webinar host. I'm a contractor supporting the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs Tribal Energy Webinar Series. Today's webinar, titled Developing the Workforce for the Energy Future, is the seventh webinar of the 2022 DOE Tribal Energy Webinar Series. Let's go over some event details. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on DOE's Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs website in about one week. Copies of today's presentation slide will be posted to the Office of Indian Energy's website shortly after this webinar, if not before. Everyone will receive a post-webinar email with the link to the page where the slides and recording will be located. Because we are recording this webinar, all phones have been muted. We will answer your written questions at the end of the final presentation. You can submit a question at any time by clicking on the question button located in the webinar control box on your screen and typing in your question. We'll get started with some opening remarks from Lozana Pierce. Ms. Pierce is a senior engineer and the deployment supervisor for the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs and is duty stationed in Golden, Colorado. She's responsible for, responsible for the execution of the deployment program, which is national in scope. Specifically, the deployment program includes financial assistance, technical assistance, and education and outreach. She also implements national funding opportunities and administers some of the resultant tribal energy project grants and agreements. She has over 25 years of experience in project development and management and has been assisting tribes in developing their energy resources for over 20 years. Ms. Pierce holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Colorado State University. Lizana, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, James, and hello, everyone. I join James in welcoming you to today's webinar. This webinar series is sponsored by the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs, otherwise referred to for short, the Office of Indian Energy. The Office of Indian Energy's congressional charter is to promote Indian energy development, efficiency and use, reduce or stabilize energy costs, enhance and strengthen Indian tribal energy and economic infrastructure, and to bring electric power and service to Indian lands and homes. To provide this assistance, our deployment program partners with Indian tribes and Alaska Native villages to overcome the barriers to energy development. Our deployment program, as James said, is comprised of a three-prong approach consisting of financial assistance through competitive grants, technical assistance at no cost to tribes and tribal entities, and education and capacity building. This tribal energy webinar series is just one example of our education and capacity building efforts. Specifically, the webinar series is intended to provide attendees with information on tools and resources to develop and implement tribal energy plans, programs, and projects, to highlight tribal energy case studies, and identify business strategies tribes can use to expand their energy options and develop sustainable local economies. This year's webinar series, entitled Empowering Native Communities and Sustaining Future Generations, is focused on changing the changing energy landscape and how tribes can position themselves to participate in the energy transition to the benefit of their communities and future generations. In this seventh webinar of a series, we'll explore tribal energy employment and how this opportunity is expanding as we transition to clean energy. As we transition to a new energy future, energy systems and technologies will continue to evolve. This transition will require workers with different skills and knowledge, but tribes can take advantage of this transition by developing a tribal workforce with the skills necessary for these new jobs. This webinar will share some energy job trends and showcase a variety of tribal case studies demonstrating paths towards developing a workforce for the new energy future. We do hope this webinar and the series as a whole is useful to you. We also welcome your feedback. So please let us know if there's ways we can make the series better. Feedback can be sent to our main email at indianenergy.hq.doe.gov. And before I turn it back to James, I wanna personally thank the presenters for giving up their time and preparing for and presenting on today's webinar. Thank you all. And with that, the virtual floor is yours, James. Thanks, Lizana. Before we get started with the presentations, I first want to introduce all of today's speakers. Our first presenter is David Kaiser. David is a uh, senior advisor in the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Jobs and Office of Policy. 
on detail from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where he is a senior labor economist. Prior to his work at the laboratory, he worked for the state of Colorado as an economist in the state demography office within the Department of Local Affairs. David holds bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from Colorado State University. Following David, we will hear from John Redcloud. John is managing director at Redcloud Renewable. John was born and raised on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and is a sixth generation descendant of Chief Red Cloud. John has a BA from the University of San Diego and was a high school teacher prior to his career in renewable energy. Our third presenter following John will be Arash Molemi, sorry, sorry, Arash, Deputy General Manager of the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority Generation Inc a wholly owned subsidiary of NTUA. Arash previously served as NTUA's general counsel from March 2013 through December 2021. Arash obtained his degree in business administration, operations management from California State University Fullerton, and later earned his Juris Doctorate from Florida Coastal School of Law. He spent his entire legal career serving his Navajo people. Our fourth presentation today will be from Jean Quinn. Jean has a four decade career in the utility industry, working his way up from a meter reader with Mojave Electric Co-op to his current position as the Assistant General Manager at Aha Makav Power Service, a tribally, tribally chartered by the Fort Mojave Indian Tribe. Our final presentation will be from Stephanie Bostwick. Stephanie is a project manager in resilient system design and engineering group at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where she has worked closely with American Indian tribes on resilience and energy sovereignty. Today, she will, she will be presenting on her work with Northwest Indian College, whose main campus is located in Lummi, at the Lummi Nation. Thanks to each of our presenters for making the time to join us today. With that, let's get started with our first presentation. David, you may proceed once we have your slides up. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for joining this webinar today. Um, I will be talking about energy jobs in the United States, and uh, let's go into the next slide. Um, all of the jobs data that I'll be uh, presenting today comes from our Department of Energy, United States Energy and Employment Report. Um, just a little background on what this report is. It is a combination of data from surveys and then also data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, we get somewhere between 33 and 35,000 responses from employers across the United States uh, in the energy sector to um, understand what's going on um, in the energy space. We published the first report in 2016. Uh, DOE published it in 2017, and then uh, the National Association of State Energy Officials and Energy Futures Initiative published it uh, from 2018 to 2020, and it is now back at DOE for the past two years. Right now, the report has uh, data for the nation and then also all 50 states in the District of Columbia, but uh, next month, we will be releasing county level data for 2022, and we plan on releasing county level data next year as well. So if you're interested, uh, keep an eye out for that. Let's go to the next slide here. There are a few highlights that came out of this report this year. Um, we saw uh, in 2021 positive job growth amongst uh, basically all major categories within energy jobs. The only uh, exceptions to that would are we're in uh, the fuel space, especially petroleum. Overall, energy jobs grew faster than the U.S. economy as a whole, but going back to 2020, they actually declined faster than the economy as a whole in 2020, and so we're still uh, trying to dig out of that hole. Um, we also saw strong job growth in clean energy industries and carbon reducing energies and carbon reducing technologies um, while the job declines as i mentioned were in um, fossil fuels we do see the need for additional investments 
in this area in order to really turbocharge this clean energy workforce. And we certainly also see some opportunities for improvements with diversity in that area as well. And so the, there are some, uh, certainly are some opportunities moving forward. So let's move to the next slide. So I will start out talking about some of the national data and the national trends, and then I'll move into some of the state level information. So let's move to the next slide. Overall in 2021, we saw that there were 7.8 million energy jobs in the United States. That is an increase of about 300,000 from 2020. And so that is 4% growth. And as I mentioned, that is faster than the US economy as a whole, which grew 2.8%. And that is actually pretty typical for the energy sector. Um, going back to 2016, it's grown at um, about twice the rate as the US economy as a whole. Um, so we typically do see faster than average growth there. And let's move to the next slide. When I talk about energy jobs, the way that this report organizes it is we have five major categories. That's electricity, uh, transmission, distribution, and storage, fuels, energy efficiency, and motor vehicles, with motor vehicles being the largest sector um, overall. This differs a little bit from the way that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Bureau of Economic Analysis, Census, and those other data agencies look at um, jobs because what they do is they'll look at it as industries, which you can see the list of industries on the bottom here in the legend, where we've got agriculture, manufacturing, uh, professional services, et cetera. Um, what we do is we look at each of these categories as a combination of energy jobs that are in in uh, each of these industries. Uh, so for example, in energy efficiency, when you look at that category, you can see that about half of those energy efficiency jobs are in construction, but that isn't the only industry that uh, each of these categories um, is made up of. And so, so it's a little bit different that way. And so when we go into fuels, for example, as another example, a lot of people think of fuels as just being extraction. Um, and that's not what that is. There still are the, uh, jobs like um, accountants that support uh, fuel, fuel companies and things like that. And so it is a comprehensive look at what's going on within each of these technology categories. Uh, the one industry that we don't include in any of these categories is retail sales. And the reason why is that it just gets too difficult to parse out what's energy and what's not energy within that category. So for example, if you have someone who's working at a uh, gas station, is that an energy job or is it not an energy job? Are they selling fuel or are they selling um, food? Um, it, it's too difficult to pull that apart. And so that is not included in here. Let's move to the next slide. But as I mentioned, all technology groups except for fuel grew in 2021. 2021 growth, while it was fast and faster than the economy as a whole, it wasn't enough to make up for uh, the total energy jobs lost in 2020. Um, in 2020, over 500,000 energy jobs were lost in 2020, um, and we grew uh, about, about uh, 300,000 this year. So the, um, there are still fewer energy jobs than there were in 2019. This isn't true of all technology categories, and I'll get to that in just a little bit, but it is true uh, for most. Union density in the energy sector is actually higher than the national average for private sector employers. Um, so there is more union representation in energy. Uh, demographically, we do see females and black or African-American workers represented at lower than average percentages, uh, while at the same time, workers of two or more races are more represented in the energy sector than other, um, than other races. And we also see a higher than average concentration of veterans uh, and lower than average concentration of workers over the age of 55. 
And when I say concentration, I'm talking about the percentage of workers in the energy space. And that is compared to these characteristics of the national workforce as a whole. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Doing a, just a bit of a deeper dive though on the uh, American Indian and Alaska natives in the energy workforce, uh, this group is represented at higher than average, um, more represented than uh, the national workforce average. Um, so nationally, this group is about 1% of the overall workforce, whereas on average within the energy space, um, the American Indian and Alaska natives are uh, an average of 2% of the uh, energy workforce. And really it's much higher within the transmission distribution and storage category than uh, these other categories. But overall within each of these groups, um, the representation is higher than the national average. So let's move on to the next slide. With some more top line findings. Um, motor vehicles is the largest sector within um, the energy job space, which includes repairs and manufacturing, and it also grew the fastest. And in um, 2021. Within transmission, distribution, and storage, all technologies within that sector grew. In electric power generation, all technologies in electricity grew except for uh, nuclear electricity generation and coal uh, electricity generation. Nuclear is actually pretty interesting because jobs actually declined in nuclear electricity generation while at the same time they increased in nuclear fuels. But overall, there were decline in fuel jobs, and that was really uh, driven by decreases in coal and petroleum. And we also asked employers as part of the survey if they're having hiring difficulties, various levels of hiring difficulties. And what we saw is that basically across the board, employers reported difficulties hiring workers. And let's move on to the next slide. And we saw some of the fastest growth in the vehicle space, especially with clean vehicles. Uh, we saw electric vehicle job growth by electric vehicle jobs increase by 26.2%. So that's almost 22,000 new jobs hybrid electric vehicle jobs increasing almost 20%, and so that's almost 24,000 new jobs. So that's extraordinarily fast growth. You think about going back to that economy-wide job growth number being 2.8%, these increasing by 20 and 26% is just very, very fast job growth. We also saw very fast growth in solar electricity increasing by 5.4%. And so that's adding um, over 17,000 new jobs. That was actually the fastest job growth in that electricity space and that electric power generation space. So there's a lot going on with solar. Uh, wind also increased by 2.9% with a little bit over 3,000 new jobs. And yes, that's fewer than um, some of these that we're seeing with, with these vehicles and solar, but wind also didn't lose jobs in 2020. And so it's one of the few sectors to actually exceed its 2019 numbers. Energy efficiency jobs increased across the board within energy efficiency. So that grew by 2.7%. And so that's almost 58,000 new jobs. And then transmission distribution and storage increased almost 2%. And that was another 23,000 new jobs. Let's go on to the next slide. And there were only eight technology groups that surpassed their 2019 levels. And what's interesting about this is that all of these are in 
uh, carbon reducing uh, categories. And I'm considering natural gas vehicles to be a carbon reducing category because it emits less, less carbon than a regular petroleum vehicle. Um, and so um, that is something that's really interesting to come out of this. Uh, but the most of these, uh, the most jobs in here are really in um, clean, cleaner vehicles where we've got the most from uh, hybrids, EVs, and, and plug-in electric vehicles. <clears throat> so let's move on to the next slide. And with that, I will dive into some uh, state level data. Let's go to the next slide. On a state basis, motor vehicles added the most jobs, and so states with uh, higher growth in motor vehicle, higher concentration in motor vehicle jobs experienced the fastest job growth. Um, overall, Michigan added the most jobs, and that's followed by uh, Texas with just under 31,000, and then California with uh, just over 29,000. When we look at the number of jobs added, Cal or Texas actually added the most, but it also lost the most uh, in petroleum jobs. It lost 14,000 petroleum jobs. When I say lost, it doesn't necessarily mean that those jobs went away, but they're just fewer jobs. Um, but Texas declined by 14,000 uh, in petroleum jobs, which is significantly more than any other state. Uh, the next the, the next highest losses were in Louisiana with 3,700. And so that number in Texas was um, quite significant. <clears throat> so let's move on to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit more about growth rates. Um, most of uh, the fastest fuel growth was actually in the nor northern states in the northern Midwest. So that was kind of around northern west and Midwest. Uh, this is around the uh, back in formation. So the fastest growth is really up there in North Dakota and Montana. Uh, all the way across the country uh, to the south. The third fastest growth was in uh, New Mexico with 5%. So that actual growth rate in North Dakota, 21%, is quite a bit faster than even the, the following two states for growth. Um, in terms of electricity growth, we saw the fastest growth uh, in the Midwest right along the uh, so-called wind belt. And so we're seeing that in Nebraska, Minnesota, and Iowa. And so those are really uh, geographically uh, grouped together. Moving to the next slide. The growth rate in vehicles, we saw this really uh, dispersed geographically. Uh, the fastest was in Texas, and then shortly behind that was in Tennessee, and then that was followed by Indiana. And so the top two states, I guess you could say, are in the South and then Indiana in the Midwest. Um, but uh, really strong growth in that southeastern, south, southeastern part of the United States. Transmission distribution and storage, that growth was actually the fastest in Appalachia. We saw that growing 29% in West Virginia and then 14% in Pennsylvania. And so um, West Virginia, uh, that transmission distribution and storage in West Virginia in particular is really propping up the energy jobs in that state. Um, and then Oklahoma was the third for that. And let's move to the next slide. And then we saw the fastest growth in energy efficiency in the south, southwestern part of the United States, uh, led by led by Nevada at seven percent, New Mexico also at seven percent, and Oklahoma at five percent. Um, Oklahoma and New Mexico were the only two states in the United States where they were in the top three for one or more of uh, these uh, different technology groups. So certainly we see New Mexico and Oklahoma in energy efficiency, but then Oklahoma was the third highest growth in transmission distribution and storage. And then New Mexico was third also in fuels. And so those states had uh, a lot of activity in the energy space. Now let's move on to the next slide. 
This year's report, we also looked at something called net zero aligned jobs. Uh, the definition of net zero aligned is basically technologies that can get us to a net zero carbon future. And so those include um, zero carbon um, emitting technologies like nuclear, as well as uh, renewables. And when I say renewables, that does include um, biofuels. So the states with the highest number of net zero line jobs, uh, California is by far the highest uh, with 2.7 million. And then the next closest is actually Texas. Um, but these are also, these states that have the highest numbers of these net zero line jobs are actually states that have the most people <laughs> and the most workers. Um, and so it's also useful to look at states where uh, the net zero aligned that have the highest percentage of energy jobs in these net zero aligned areas. And so Vermont is actually the highest uh, with 58% in these uh, top five states, uh, Vermont, Nevada, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, and Rhode Island, that ranges from anywhere between 58% and 52% of total jobs. And um, it's not in this slide, but of national nationally, uh, the net zero number of net zero aligned or percentage of net zero aligned as a portion of all energy jobs is about 40 percent just under 40 percent that said uh, we'll move to the next slide and i'll just say thank you all uh, you have my email address if you have any questions about any of this i think we may have some time at the end of this uh, webinar for q a and uh, i'll stick around for any questions that uh, may arise at the end. Excellent. Thanks, David. Appreciate you providing this broad kind of high-level perspective. Uh, and we do have a question for you that, that at this time that we'll, you know, give you a, during the Q&A. So with that, we'll, with that, we'll move on to, to John Redcloud. John, once we pull your slides up, you're, you're ready to go. Great. Thank you very much. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I want to give Quick thank you to James Jensen and Lazana Pierce for setting all this in motion and providing us really a great platform to speak today to a wider audience. And I want to say good morning to those perhaps still in the morning, and then of course good afternoon to those who may be in other uh, time zones. Um, again, my name is John Red Cloud, Managing Director for Red Cloud Renewable. Um, as you can see on the slide there, we are a perpetually Native American led nonprofit and we are based on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation which is in southwest South Dakota so fairly small um, footprint uh, uh, but our land base is actually about the size of Connecticut so a lot of acreage there uh, tribal membership um, you know latest census data I know they had done an update was you know 30,000 ish plus somewhere in those you know in those areas so um we're doing work here and and i guess primarily our focus is um helping you know tribal people native americans and and others um, understand today's climate resilient solutions um, with the by empowering them with renewable skills and education of tomorrow and, and this kind of goes back to the ethos of the organization um and i think that Part of that um, approach that we have is, you know, ingraining our cultural values into the organization and, and how we really face outward um, and, and, and staying really true to that. And, and one thing that our executive director, uh, his name is Chief Henry Redcloud, he's always talks about walking the prayer forward for the seventh generation. Um, essentially, you know, meaning that, you know, we are all of course responsible today for the conditions that we put in place for the next generation so gathering um today to me is is a great example of that and i'm real actually humbled and honored to be included in this group of luminaries i'm, I'm really um, you know kind of sitting here in awe of the of the groups that are here and and just grateful to have a voice um and it's really great that uh David was able to provide such informative data. I mean, 
completely impactful. I was at NREL last week for a tour and they're really leading the way in research and development and providing many useful tools for those of us that are in Indian country doing work on the ground here. So grateful to all the folks at NREL as well. Wonderful staff there and great hospitality. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so that's a kind of a shot there of our campus, we like to call it, and uh, our, our mission statement. We have um, kind of there, stimulate a significant revisioning of tribal communities where energy is created in renewable ways. Meals are nutritional and fortified by traditional Lakota foods. Homes are built in a sustainable way with local tribal builders and materials, and the land is cared for and regenerated with the next seven generations. That approach there really speaks to the grassroots formation of Red Cloud Renewable, and, and I think could could be a great way. You know, we we would like to see um, other tribes um, form partnerships, coalitions that really bridge across, you know, from the tribal governments to uh, spiritual leaders, elders in the community. I think that's an important way to start a movement, and we're we're hoping that other tribes can um, see some of the work that we've been doing, and then make that make that transition, provide a concerted effort, and do something similar that really helps and focuses on the community there and involves people as stakeholders, because it's really important that. Um, tribes kind of lead the way individually for their people there. So we're we're really hoping others, you know, can kind of emulate and, and perhaps replicate and, and, and scale up what Red Cloud Renewable has done and, and, and I think serves as a great example of, of a way to kind of confidently step into that energy future, if you will. Um, uh, next slide, please. So Red Cloud Renewable um, does have four pillars. Uh, as you can see there, we have our renewable energy side. Um, one of our hallmark programs is Tribal Train the Trainer, which is a great example of workforce development. Essentially, this empowers tribal members to come to Red Cloud Renewable, receive this training through the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners. They, you know, it's a it's a NABCEP certification for a solar associate. The idea is for those tribal members to go back to their individual reservations or tribal communities and pass that on, pass it forward. And the hope is that by learning something with the intent to pass that knowledge on to others, that they're going to more deeply ingrain those concepts. and. As many of us know here, renewable industry, you know, has been, you know, experiencing uh, phenomenal growth, really. So the the learning curve and and technology changes and will continue to change, you know, at a, at a very rapid pace and, and and disseminate to tribal communities. So the key is to stay on top of that and have as many uh, trainings as possible and 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 really create that workforce that people in their tribal communities can then look to other tribal members. And we believe it's a reflection of themselves. So they can go there and look at um, maybe one of their cousins or uncles or aunties or, you know, somebody that had been to the training and came back and now they're, you know, demonstrating and showing knowledge of this renewable energy. Um, uh, then we have our food sovereignty program on the Pine Ridge Reservation there. Um, and, and we think this is a great way to uh, really bring in community and this year for example we have a um, elder food grow program where we got input from local elders what sort of food would you like to see grown and harvested and you know we were able to provide that um, during harvest time this year and and bring that bring a, a a smile to the face of some of the elders you know knowing that it was something being done here and shows again as an example of of, of kind of what can be done on a community level uh, land stewardship, we're really proud of our reforestation program. Um, uh, we're at this 
spring, we're going to have our most ambitious undertaking, 43,000 trees planting on various parts of the um, Pine Ridge Reservation and also in the Black Hills around Bear Butte area. We've also participated in that. So would like to continue to do that as well. Um, and just, again, economic opportunity for locals um, planting trees. Um, and then our sustainable building arm, um, we have a really ambitious project called Wachoni, which in Lakota means life. And we're trying to undertake a way of utilizing local materials there through this compressed earth block. Um, and then also a really unique concept and, and partnership we formed with an organization called In Our Hands, and we're doing cellular concrete homes, which is really, they kind of call them like foam, foamcrete, foam domes. Amazing concept. We are we are doing that, and again, we're hoping that can provide a solution to really a housing crisis that's on many reservations. So those are our four pillars. There. Um, next slide, please. So, growing up on the reservation, um, you know, uh, you really take stock of where of how things are when you grow up. And you don't really understand or, or 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 realize kind of the situation until maybe you leave. But many, many, you know, probably in the in attendance know that lots of tribes do have lower than average per capita incomes. Um, I, I believe Red Cloud Renewable believes that it's a lack of workforce development. And when that occurs, then, you know, the hope gets diminished and e economic, economic opportunities are, are, are lacking. And then it begins this self-perpetuating, you know, cycle. So on our on the, on the Pine Ridge Reservation, for example, um, data suggests you know, unemployment is around 70, 80 percent. Um, and as you can see here, um, the biggest employers are generally the tribe and then schools and then the government. So IHS or BIA jobs. And if you're not one of those, chances are you're probably not working, you may be involved in a cottage industry, making artwork or doing something, but generally not having that there. So another stark example, you know, of kind of the conditions on reservations. Um, next slide, please. And kind of going back to um, many, many tribes are geographically, you know, isolated. I'm, it would, it would be similar to um, many cities or, or, or smaller rural communities and, and most many tribes we work with in the northern plains areas are geographically remote um, so they don't have that access to training centers so part of the I think solution here is to provide tribes with access to training centers either right on their reservations or within reasonable travel distance um, you know, and 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 by doing so, and and training folks in workforce development in Pine Ridge, we're able to provide a pathway for tribal members, other Native Americans, to to join the solar workforce with us. You know, looking towards tomorrow, forward leaning. So for us, we've been able to work so far with the 70 tribes, um, and and upskill and train 1,100 students. So um, as as we know, there are 574 federally recognized tribes and more than 2 million tribal members. So uh, calling it the tip of the iceberg is really a disservice. We have much more work to do. Uh, great opportunities exist. And and so we're, we're there. And, and I would like to think that this is just the beginning of a, a greater shift in momentum and, 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 and just a new paradigm. Um, next slide, please. And part of this is, I believe, um, Red Cloud Renewable believes, is kind of a pan-Indian, pan-Native movement. You know, collaborative effort, efforts amongst tribes are really crucial. You know, we have to get together, we have to communicate, we have to find common ground together, and I think that's really a key here. So for our experience, Native-led organizations are able to engage in what I like to call WAM campaigns, winning, winning of hearts and minds. You know, this is critical. Um, community buy-in, creating stakeholders amongst elders, amongst spiritual leaders, amongst the youth. It's really important that this gets normalized 
and people can see this is not just concept or something they see on TV or, or a sci-fi episode. This is happening on their reservation, in their communities, on their backyards, in their auntie's house, on the roofs. You know, these are really, really important for people to see. And 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 to me, that that really enhances that buy-in, which is pretty crucial. Um, as a grassroots organization, um, you know, we're we're able to say confidently that those types that are formed in that manner, at least in Indian country for sure, um, they really enhance that focus on many reservations, which traditionally, and we're hoping to change that conversation, but they've been marginalized. Um, lots of resources have been out there, but sometimes they kind of skip over areas that are rural, South Dakota, North Dakota, you know, where there's not so many people. And, and, and again, we're hoping to change that you know, because we are still here and we want to be here tomorrow in a bigger way. So our, our, our course, uh, belief, belief is place-based initiatives um, go beyond the traditional workforce development because we, we know these efforts are more acutely aware of these needed foundational changes and can be in place to kind of be that voice using cultural wisdom, using the ethos, using the people, using that spiritual knowledge and, and you know, kind of the heritage and the culture, pageantry, it's all beautiful and we think can contribute to um, workforce development in, 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 in ways that are not possible, we believe, in, in, in some mainstream um, circles. Uh, next slide, please. So for um, the, the, these are examples, for, for examples quickly here of workforce development issues uh, initiatives that we have implemented, uh, again, our tribal train the trainer, T4, we call it. This is classroom instruction and hands-on experience at the Red Cloud Renewable Energy Center. So again, that's one of our one of our programs. We recently were awarded a DOE weatherization, uh, weatherization assistance program grant. Uh, we're calling it Native to Native Energy Sovereignty, and that's a three-year grant. Um, and then what that is doing is creating a native workforce that goes in and weatherizes homes doing deep energy retrofits and, and adding solar deployment to these homes and, and um, really doing something unique that's never been done. So we're excited about that. It should be starting soon. And then as I'm speaking here today, we have our Green Jobs Project, which is actually our students, our T4 graduates are now putting a solar array on top of a tribal elders home in Wagner, South Dakota, part of the Yankton Sioux tribe. So really amazing to see the photos coming out, you know, the smiles are huge, the families being benefited, and this just kind of comes full circle for us. And we're really, really grateful that we can be a part of, you know, such a movement in, um, in a reservation environment, having real world applications. And then most recently, we're waiting on news if we're able to be, if, if we're encouraged to apply for a um, program that's going to identify, recruit and train Native American women specifically to be uh, PV panel installers. So we're hoping for that. We've asked for 1.65 million. We are, you know, a federal contractor, so we feel pretty good about that. Um, and we're just kind of awaiting now. Um, and last slide, I believe, is the next one. So um, again, it's been a real privilege and honor to present today, and, and I'm really grateful that I can share um, some of the things that a successful workplace development program and collaborative effort in Indian country and amongst tribes and in communities, what that can do. And I just kind of leave you with a quote, um, as we work to create light for others, we naturally light our own way, which I think is particularly poignant for solar deployment. Um, again, thank you for allowing all of us here to present to you today and I hope um, there's lots of questions and, and, you know, generating a lot of interest. So thank you very much for your time. I yield the virtual floor back to James. Thanks so much, John. Uh, excellent presentation. We do have a few questions for you that I'll, I'll forward to you, understanding that you have to, to leave early today, but we appreciate your time and uh, let's see those over, over email. Um, with that, we'll, we'll move on to, um, uh, Arash's presentation. Arash, we'll bring your slides up and you can uh, proceed. Yeah, okay, thank you, James. I wanna thank James and the other panelists and participants in this great webinar. 
Um, my presentation is going to focus, I think, um, based on the topic of workforce development. So just to give you an overview, um, you know, NTUA Generation Inc. is the development arm of NTUA, the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, which is an enterprise of the Navajo Nation. So it's created by the Navajo Nation government to provide utility services when essentially the federal government ignored the needs of the Navajo Nation as it relates to energy and water um, in the 1930s under the Electrical electric, um, Electrification Act of 1932 or 34. Um, so that's kind of the general basis of how NTUA was created. And as time developed and the need for renewable energy was shown on the Navajo Nation, um, NTUA created NTUA Generation Inc., which is the development arm of NTUA. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to go over a little bit. If, if folks aren't familiar with solar, um, solar renewable energy, I just want to go over a slide briefly about what you know the benefits of solar energy and renewable energy overall. So solar does make a good neighbor. Um, solar facility will generate no emissions or odors or very minimal emissions and odors and will produce limited noise and have a low height profile. So when you talk about aesthetics overall, when you talk about emissions and odors, you know, solar is a good neighbor. It, it's low, it doesn't have any emissions, it doesn't have any odor. So it has a lot of benefits as far as um, when we talk about being a good neighbor. Um, these are just photos overall of, you know, solar facilities. Um, you know, we, from the NGI perspective, our focus is development on a utility scale. It's called utility generation. So the idea there is to build utility scale generation plants, large solar generation plants, and either selling that energy to another purchaser of that power or using it for our own distribution system. Okay. So for our facilities, they're long continuous rows of solar modules within a uh, fenced in perimeter, and those modules will be installed throughout the project site. Uh, the technology now, the modules are expected to rise no more than six to 10 feet above ground, depending on the angle of rotation. So if you have it in stow position, which is a flat position, it's about six to seven feet. Um, and the idea is for the solar modules to follow the direction of the sun. Um, while visible from the adjacent road, the solar project is expected to have minimal impacts on the visual landscape from a distance. Um, so you'll see solar plants out there, but at the same time, they're not large, they're not high, but you will see the reflection slightly from the solar plants overall. Um, the, the, another, the other area is just energy storage and other facilities, which we're not really focusing on. So I'll just skip over that. Next slide, please. So as it relates to workforce development, the strategy for NGI and NTUA is since you know we're an enterprise of the Navajo Nation created for the benefit of our Navajo people. And one of our big objectives is the creation of jobs through project development, the creation of jobs through energy development. Okay, so many times our initiatives and objectives are different than that of the outside world, of, of, of outside the Navajo Nation or reservations, in that when you have a 47.8% unemployment rate on the Navajo Nation, when you have a per capita income of $10,800 or so, you need to find ways to create jobs for your people and close to home. One of the big challenges we face on the Navajo Nation is we have our brothers, our sisters, our grandmas, our grandpas, aunts and uncles traveling to uh, border towns or traveling to large metropolitan areas for jobs. So essentially what they'll do is, you know, Sunday night they'll pack up um, for work on Monday, let's say in Salt Lake City. They'll work out of a hotel or, you know, do their work um, in a different area. And then on Friday, they'll come back home to be with their families. So during that time, they're going to be away from their kids, from their um, family members. So what we try to do, and our, one of our big objectives is to create jobs on the Navajo Nation. So this is just a portfolio of the jobs, I mean, of the, of the projects we've done so far. Canto One is a 27 megawatt solar generation plant that went in service in April of 2017. It's located in the Arizona portion of the Navajo Nation. 
Um, Kanta 2 is phase two of the project, a 28 megawatt project. It, it went in service in August of 2019. Uh, Drew Solar is a 100 megawatt solar project. Um, we expect that to be in service um, by the end of 22. And we have a Red Mesa solar project in the Utah portion of the Navajo Nation, which is a 72 megawatt solar plant, um, which has an in-service date of January to March of 2023. And then we have a Cameron solar project, which is a 200 megawatt solar project, um, estimated to be in service of winter of 2024. And then a Lachi uh, solar project plus battery storage. Um, we expect that to be in service of the winter of 2025. So if you can see by the dates of our projects, they essentially are staggered in increments over time. So the idea and one of our strategies, and I think this could be a strategy for other developers um, on tribal areas, is the majority of the jobs created through utility scale solar projects is through construction. And for example, Kianta One took approximately um, 12, um, I think it took approximately 18 months to build. So the idea is to have our workforce, you know, complete a project. And if they want to, they can essentially start on the next project, for example, Canta 2, and work in August of 2019. So we want to mobilize workforce that can go from job to job on the Navajo Nation or near the Navajo Nation so that they can reap the benefits of being close to their home and being on their own nation as a whole. Uh, next slide. This is a case study for the, the projects that I, or the first two projects that I just mentioned, the NTUA Solar Kianta 1 and Kianta 2 projects. Um, so this, the combined um, size of these projects is 55 megawatts. And just to show you the interest in the um, employment opportunities on the Navajo Nation and other reservations, we didn't know if we would fail. One of the big concerns um, with the developers is, do you have the workforce in the area? So on most tribal nations, you know, we're in remote areas. Kayenta is a remote area. And that was one of the concerns of the developers in NTUA initially. Do we have enough workforce that can build this project? So at the local chapter house, we had our first job fair and we had over 550 individuals attend the job fair and wait in line for since 4 a.m. to fill out an application. So with that, we knew and we know that our Navajo people and other tribal members are interested in working um, and we have the workforce available and skilled workers on um, our tribal nations. So for this, these projects, um, there were 434 construction jobs created. Um, as Mr. Redcloud mentioned, one of the key components is job training and apprenticeship programs. So the benefits of these types of um, renewable energy projects is you can teach your workforce on the job, right? You can provide the specialized job training on the job. And that's what we did for this project. So over 7,000 hours of specialized job training was provided. So these individuals were getting paid as well as getting a specialized skill um, while performing their duties. So of the 434 construction jobs created, 90% went to Navajo citizens. Okay, and I think that's key right there when you have such a high unemployment rate, when you can hire 90% of your workforce being um, tribal members, that it goes to the core component of what you're trying to do is create job, um, create jobs for your, you know, your tribal members. For solar, for utility scale generation plants and solar plants, um, there's not a high number of permanent full-time jobs. They're generally O&M jobs. So 100% of the workforce operating the two plants right now are Navajo citizens. And that's three permanent full-time jobs that have been created. Okay. Um, these are just some other facts overall with these projects. Um, you know, from a tribal perspective, one of the challenges that specifically the Navajo Nation faces is we, you know, we're 27,000 square miles and we have a large footprint and we still have about 14,500 homes without electricity. So the profit and the margin that's derived from these types of projects, they're actually brought back and put back into the utility 
to connect homes to the electric grid. Okay, and in addition, they're, uh, they allow for infrastructure to be built in rural areas. So with this project, we had to build a substation, um, and you know some of the project derived um, from the pro I mean from the proceeds, um, we were able to connect seven homes to the electric grid. Um, some of the benefits to the actual Navajo Nation. Um, the construction sales tax generated over $5 million in taxes to the Navajo Nation. <clears throat> and as part of these projects, I think one of the key components is community benefits. And for these projects, um, there's four scholarships and two internships annually, which equate to 100 scholarships and 50 internships over the life of the project. Okay, so we talk about workforce development when we talk about unemployment. Um, the total payroll for Kia to one and Kia to two was $10 million and it generated over $30 million in economic activity in the Kianta region. And we got that $30 million number from the um, multiplier um, and rollover um, study done by Arizona State University and Northern Arizona University. Next slide. <clears throat> this is the, the project that, this is another case study of a project that's currently under construction right now. So this project is majority is is fully owned by the Navajo Nation through NGI. Okay. So the direct benefits to the Navajo Nation and the Red Mesa community. Um, once again, we talk about workforce development. Um, you know, we created 434 construction jobs with the Kianta One and Kianta Two plants. Now we're going to Red Mesa, um, and approximately 250 to 300 construction jobs will be created with the projected salary payroll of 6.2 million dollars. So just to give you an idea of right now, the, the most updated report that I got, there's 146 workers on the site, of which 90% are Navajo tribal members. So, you know, that's that's the opportunity for our tribal members and other tribal members to work close to home and, you know, get a, get a good uh, paycheck each week for to, to help their family. Okay. And just to talk about the rule, um, factor on, tri on tribal nations. This this project is in Red Mesa, Utah. Of all the projects that we've uh, built so far, this is the most rural project it, in that there is not a large, even tribal community close by within prox approximately 60 miles. However, we're still able to fully um, fill all of the open positions that are necessary to build the project. So that just goes back to the the desire for our tribal members to work um, and the uh, strong workforce that's that we have on tribal nations. Um, the projected construction period is 12 months, so we'll have workers on the site for 12 months. Um, over 330 people attended the one-day drive-up COVID-safe job fair. Once again, just showing the desire that in the interest in you know in, in workforce development on the Navajo Nation um, and other tribal nations. Um, three permanent full-time jobs are going to be created, and this project will create and provide 50 scholarships and 25 internships for students within the Red Mesa community over the life of the project. Um, one of the things that we talk about here it, when it, as it relates to job workforce development is the ability for the individuals to have these specialized skills that they learn on the job but also the ability for these individuals to get promotions and can be promoted um, as part of their roles within the company. Um, so we do have a report of individual tribal members being promoted and looking to be brought on full time for other types of projects um, in the area or off the area. So that gives them additional opportunities. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just our next project. Once again, another case study similar. Um, you know, this is a Cameron solar project, a 200 megawatt solar project that is currently um, under contract and in the RFP stages. So we expect to bring this project online in late 2024. Same idea here, the creation of jobs. You know, the idea here is once the Red Mesa project is complete or near complete, we want some of that workforce to be transferred over to the Cameron project. Um, so, you know, the locations of the project, they're about, uh, they're about two and a half hours drive between the projects. But when you talk about rural tribal nations, that is, that is not a significant um, commute. You know, we have workers that commute three hours a day um, at our utility company, 
and it's just something that you do overall. So, you know, you, you have these opportunities. So this project will create 400 solar construction jobs with a projected salary, salary payroll of $8.3 million. Um, <clears throat> same idea here overall, and I just want to focus on the fact that when I talk about the jobs created, this is just for the construction of the solar plant itself. The other components of the project, i.e. the construction of the substation, the construction of the transmission line, the design and engineering of all these components, they're not included in this number. So this number is actually pretty small relative to the total number of jobs created um, as a result of the project and would result in a higher projected salary payroll. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, the, the unique nature of tribal nations and the need for infrastructure is key. So with all or most of our projects, we need to build a substation as a component of the project. And since we are a utility company, we can actually connect homes and electrify homes off of the substation we build. Okay, so for this project, we're going to build a substation in the Cameron Chapter. Um, you know, one of the unique things about this project is that we're, we're next to, if you're not familiar with the area, there is a large amount of transmission lines and large-scale substations in the area because it's near the Navajo Generating Station. And for over 60 years, that power that's been created at the Navajo Generating Station has gone off the nation. And you have Navajo homes and Navajo people that essentially the transmission line goes over or near over their home and they still are out of, they, they still are not connected to the electric grid, okay? So with this project, we don't service the territory of the, with utilities for this project. However, when we build that substation, we will be able to electrify those homes for the first time ever. So that's an exciting thing and a, and a ancillary benefits for these types of projects is we can electrify homes through the building of infrastructure related to these projects. Uh, next slide. And this is another project. This is our largest project. Um, this is the Chi Solar Project, a 400 megawatt solar plant. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at 300 to 650 construction jobs over a 24 to 36 month period. So if you look at the timeline from beginning to where we're at now, that's about on average for each project, about three to 400 jobs for each project and over an eight year period. So all these projects are under contract. These aren't under development, these are under contract. So for eight years, we're, we should have a rolling workforce of approximately three to 400 jobs, if uh, construction jobs. Um, for this project, there's 10 to 12, 10 to 20 um, full-time jobs that'll be created since it's a battery storage project um, and it'd be related to O&M. On the environmental side, you know, I know this is an this is an environmental presentation, but for these types of projects and this specific project, approximately 51,000 gigawatt hours of solar energy is produced over the life of this project and that equates and the carbon reduction is equal to planting 250 million trees or removing almost 260,000 cars from the road every year so you know with projects and tribal development we're creating jobs and we're also providing environmental benefits environmental benefits you know for for ourselves and our kids and our grandchildren um, next slide Um, this slide is related to benefits to the Navajo Nation, obviously the tribal nations. Um, one of the, these are just takeaways. I think one of the key takeaways, at least from our perspective, lessons learned is tribal ownership of projects. Um, tribal nations can demonstrate sovereignty and control by ma maintaining majority ownership of projects. So one of our key components and drivers is we want to be majority owned of the project for the benefit of the Navajo Nation. Um, lessons learned with Navajo Generating Station, with Peabody Coal Mine, with all these other projects whereby the nation was essentially lessors, 
but didn't have an ownership interest in the project and thereby didn't have any real say um, in how the projects were developed or reclaimed. Um, another key component is jobs and specialized job training, as I've mentioned. So we anticipate between 1,000 to 1,350 construction jobs will be created over the next three years and about three to 5,000 will be created over the next six years. Um, sales tax revenue, I think that's also important for revenue generators for tribal nations. So when we build a project on a tribal nation, I, I believe most tribal nations have a sales tax component, a tribal sales tax component or construction tax. So we think that's important to for the tribe to capture that benefit to increase their overall revenue and exercise sovereignty as it can, as it relates to um, overall operation of, of the tribe. Next slide. Um, and lease and transmission revenue, that's specifically tailored to um, NTUA and the Navajo Nation, but you know, you, you're gonna get some lease and tra transmission revenue through projects. And at least for purposes of NTUA, the revenue generated by the NTUA renewable energy projects um, stay on the Navajo Nation. Since we are an enterprise of the nation, that money it stays on the nation. You know, a lot of times with, or at least for the Navajo Nation, our Navajo people earn our money. We make money and we, you know, we earn money on the Navajo Nation, but we spend it all in border towns. We spend it all off the nation in big cities. And they reap the benefits of sales tax, of jobs, of other um, infrastructure benefits. And we come back to the nation and essentially we have our goods, but really the money isn't staying on the nation, it's going off the nation. With these projects, the revenue is coming back onto the nation and staying on the nation to help keep electric rates low and to electrify homes. And next slide. And lastly, this is the, um, for, for the Navajo Nation, President Jonathan Nez and Vice President Myron Leiser signed the Hyle Cough Proclamation. Um, and that proclamation states that the Navajo Nation will pursue and prioritize clean renewable energy development for the long-term benefit of the Navajo people. And the proclamation is based on four principles, cultivating a diver diverse energy portfolio, restoring the land and water, rural electrification of homes, and development of utility scale renewable energy projects. And uh, with that, I'm done with my presentation. Thanks Thank you so much, Arash. Thank you. A, a wonderful presentation. Uh, congratulations on the pipeline of solar projects. It's, it's impressive and it, it's valuable for our audience to see the uh, uh, the benefits of that flow from these projects and, and the nature of them and the, the surge in construction jobs and then the comparatively small long-term employment, but, but, but still substantive. So, so thanks for, for sharing that. We really appreciate it, and, and we do have some questions for you at the end of the webinar. Um, with that, Jean, we're we'll pull up your slides, and, and you'll be next. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank uh, for giving us an opportunity to share the success with here at Ahamakov Power. First slide, please. Okay. Since the first meter was set, there had been many obstacles overcome here at Ahamakab Power. On September of 1991, the Mojave County Board of Supervisors voted to delay the action of the franchise agreement for the proposed FMIT Power Company until a committee can be formed to investigate the impact of the new utility on the area. Mojave Electric Co-op MEC provided power to the entire South Valley area and has power poles located on the reservation land. As they expressed concern that the new utility would make expansion by MEC difficult if there were no longer allowed to place utility poles on tribal land. In December of 1991, after a long legal disagreement was resolved and the franchise agreement was granted, and, that, and the right-of-way was awarded to Ahamakab Power. Ahamakab Power AMPS was created in June of 1991 by the Fort Mojave Indian Tribal Council. 
our first customer meter set was completed in February of 1992 in the Mesquite Creek subdivision. This was our first underground distribution circuit in the area. Uh, the tribal linemen that we employ here at Ahamaka Power completed the merchant's journeyman certification. Our linemen consists of three tribal linemen journeyman and one apprentice journeyman or apprentice lineman. These uh, linemen, when they first started uh, working for Ahamaka Power, uh, there was a job posting down at the tribal HR administration and the three members applied for the job. They first started working with the contractors to build the Claude Lewis substation on the Arizona side of the river. They also worked with Sturge Electric to build a transmission line into the substation. Each of them completed certification and went on as a full-time employee with the knowledge and skills and ability to work on high voltage electrical lines. With this power utility that has opened an opportunity for future tribal members to learn skill with professional high paying career. The program for the merchant program that we are signed up with uh, is a four year apprenticeship program. The next slide please. The merchant program consists of 800,000 hours on the job training. The job training consists of a series of tests that require home study. The book work each year requires the apprentice to complete nine chapters of the study. And all test scores must be 70% in order to advance to the next step. Next slide, please. Ability to use the equipment associated with working on high voltage electrical lines and apparatus safely. Before the crew starts a project, the crew will complete a job briefing tailboard discussion to ensure personnel knows the task to perform the job safely. Our line department requires to be on call 24 seven. We rotate each lineman weekly for our on-call. AMPS provides the safety and training to all our personnel. This is done on a monthly basis with ESCI, safety training and wellness services. And we also do that in conjunction with the City of Needles line department as well, which helps offset the cost providing that safety services. Some of the uh, topics that are provided for the safety would be our bucket rescue, our CPS, C, CPR first aid, our substation safety, our OSHA 30 training, our switching and clearances, etc. are just a few. Next slide. Here I've got a picture of our one line of AMPS's solar system that's been added to our one line on all our circuits that feed into two of our substations, the uh, No Name substation and the Norm McDowell switchyard. Next slide, please. Here we have a picture of a line that we built to the city of Needles. Um, they were in need of bringing in another transmission circuit to the city. They only had one transmission feed. Uh, Western WAPA came to us and provided the funds to, to build the line. Our linemen built the line and we uh, strung all the wire and we connected it into um, the substation over on the California side of the river. Next slide, please. Mojave Electric Cooperative MEC was providing power to the entire South Valley area 
and has power poles located on the reservation land, we actually, there was a hard <laughs> sell to be able to get our power company off and moving because of the fact that they thought that we would infringe on them not being able to provide power to the South Valley, which um, they they actually were able to uh, move and move forward and uh, make this happen uh, with the tribe. They they finally uh, agreed for the right of way and it was resolved in 1991. Next slide. AMP service territory was limited in the amount of capacity. Our, uh, our transmission line, uh, the capacity of the AMP's growth and utility work with Western Area Power WAP to solve this problem for transmission capacity into the service territory. In November 1991, AMP's first substation was energized. The substation was a Claude Lewis substation and we transferred the existing customer from amps to the new Colorado River substation energized the Nevada project with the Avi casino being online as well as the Fort Mojave Indian tribal authorities well water well and sewer lift stations this project brought a bright looking future for the tribal enterprise in June of 2005, AMPS energized the no-name substation that provided 25 kV distribution power circuit to Arizona, California villages and the farmlands in the South Valley. The 69 kV feed came from Southwest Transmission Cooperative, Southwest Transco, out of the Topox substation. Next slide, please. This slide picks um, our crew at work on 69 kV line and some of our equipment that we use to be able to perform our job duties uh, with the line department. Next slide, please. AMPS currently services power in three states, Arizona, Nevada, and California. AMPS has one transmission feed crossing the Colorado River and three distribution feeds. And we also own about 18.5 miles of transmission line in Nevada. Nevada, this was uh, the old BIA line that we used to feed off of and the line was built in 1943. And many of the structures showed wear and tear as the years went by. It has been a reliable line serving Fort Mojave Indian Reservation and under emergency conditions. Several communities in the area also were served. But the nearing end of its useful service life in October 7th, of October of 2007, AMPS had the 69 kV line rebuilt from Davis Dam to the Nora McDowell Switchyard substation. In 2008, Western Power Administration, WAPA, proposed to build a 69 kV transmission line between existing Ahamaka Power Services, the no-name substation, to promote proposed firehouse switchyard in the city of Needles. The 69 kV transmission line was constructed on a single steel pole, approximately 3.95 miles in length, crossing the Colorado River. Western funded the project and AMPS line crew built the circuit in the AMPS right away. Next slide, please. Here we have a picture of the rebuilt from Davis Dam to the Nora McDowell substation. Next slide, please. This pic is a, our no name substation. We have never named it yet. We're kind of waiting, but uh, I'm just showing you in this pic that um, this is where our solar field is tied into our bus work on our on our uh, from our solar field uh, into the substation. 
We also, um, in 2005, we converted all our oil hydraulic reclosures to vacuum reclosures for the upgrade, got rid of our oil reclosures. Next slide, please. On February 2018, AMPS moved forward for a solar feasibility study submitted by Stockbridge Energy Group. We believe the proposed solar system was a great first step towards tribal energy independence. This 2.1 megawatt fixed system was completed in September 2020. This will produce approximately 3.9 megawatts of power, which will help reduce the tribe's dependency on the outside power market providers. The 2.3 megawatt phase one solar project is applying power to the AMP system, which offsets a portion of the tribe's hydro energy needs. The 2.3 megawatt system has helped Ahamaka Power Service support the additional power supply for the Fort Mojave Reservation, including the Avi Resort and Casino. Also have 714 residential homes and 290 commercial businesses, plus the tribe's 26 irrigation pumping stations irrigating 12,000 acres of farming land. Overall, the Fort Mojave 2.3 megawatt solar system phase one project has strengthened the economy reliance, workforce development, and be more self-sufficient from the electrical grid. AMPS is pursuing another phase two construction solar grant through the Economic Development Administration, EDA, with another 2.3 second phase solar field, the reservation will be benefit receiving lower price energy costs, clean renewable energy to decrease financial burdens, high utility bill costs, and revitalizing the, the tribal economy through the creation of new skilled labor jobs. AMP system mileage summary infrastructure in closing. AMP system mileage summary, transmission lines, we have 20.5 miles of transmission. Our primary overhead distribution is 87.47 miles, and our primary underground distribution is 16.89 miles. Next slide, please. This is a picture of our first solar site tied into our no-name substation. As you can see, we've got around 22 more acres that we can fill in on this farmland located off a of reservation road in Mountain View here in Mojave Valley, Arizona. Next slide, please. Our continuing growth in solar, we're looking at our phase two, which will pick the same uh, location to the west of our first completed phase one project. And our phase three, as you can see on, on the graph, will be our phase three that we wanna eventually have battery backup on that solar phase three project for future. And it, we would like to be, the tribe would like to pursue forward on being so totally self-sufficient from the grid in the future. Next slide, please. And I want to thank James and, and the whole group for allowing Ahamakov to present uh, this project or this seminar for you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gene. Appreciate the perspective and Ahamakov's uh, success story of, of, you know, developing the utility and, and tribal workforce as well as moving into a a solar future. It's, it's good to see. Um, with that, we'll move on to our last uh, presentation uh, from uh, Stephanie Bostwick. Uh, we'll bring up your slides, Stephanie, and uh, after your presentation, we'll likely have a few minutes for a Q&A. So please submit any written questions you have, and go ahead, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Bostwick. Uh, I'm Blackfeet, and I live in Bellingham, Washington, and I've worked for the Lummi Nation at Northwest Indian College and as part of their Solar Task Force um, since early 2019. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Lummi's vision for energy sovereignty um, and where we've gone so far and where we're going. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'll just give you a quick background of Lummi Nation location and population size and then talk through um, just how we made a vision for energy sovereignty, um, what different grants we've applied for and received, and how we've integrated that with the education programs that we offer at Northwest Indian College. Next slide. Um, so on the right of that map, you can see, um, sorry, on the right, you can see a map of the reservation, um, which despite being close to Bellingham proper, is a relatively small community. Um, the population, I believe, is around 6,600 at the moment. Um, and in the upper right there, you can see some of the buildings I'm gonna talk about. Um, you can see Northwest Indian College, the health clinic, the admin building, um, and Head Start, which is our early learning center. Um, and then on the south end of the map there, you can see the Weckland, which is the community building, and Lummi Nation School is that K-12 school that's marked on the map there, um, which is where we do a lot of our outreach. Um, and just for a brief history of the college, it started as a school of aquaculture, um, but now we are a bachelor's um, offering institution serving over 100 different tribes, and we've got seven campus locations. Uh, next slide. Um, so recognizing that a lot of planning um, and energy was put into this prior to my starting um, in 2019, I'm just going to walk through um, the timeline from there forward because that's really when we got moving on some of these grants and projects. Um, so everything started in the late fall of 2019 um, when there was a meeting organized by Spark Northwest, which is a local nonprofit out of Seattle. Um, and Spark really helped Lummi Nation uh, get going on the first couple of grant applications, um, which is kind of what they do with tribal technical assistance to show people how to kind of prioritize your uh, list of opportunities and then start applying for funds. Um, and Lummi Indian Business Council then passed a resolution to start a solar task force. Um, which I've been part of since that um, time. And we've really taken you know, the grant process and moved forward with applying for the future grant opportunities um, and planning for the nation. And I'm happy to say that we recently changed our name um, to the Energy Task Force um, you know, to say solar is not the only thing that we need um, to move towards sovereignty. Um, so we're gonna start looking at other opportunities as well. Next slide. Um, so again, uh, Spark Northwest really helped us get going on the first couple of solar installation grants that you see there. Um, just this year, we were able to get uh, about a million dollars in funding for solar installation grants. So we've come a long way since, since our first couple of applications. Um, but once we completed those first couple of grants, um, the, the task force really took over applying for funds and, and moving forward. Um, and we applied for these um, to complete two microgrid feasibility studies. You see one here for Lummi Nation, um, and then I'll talk about the one we've done at the college. Um, but, you know, we started thinking about resilience and future sovereignty, um, and that's where the microgrid studies were integrated into the work that we were doing. Um, as we applied for funds, we really made sure that the college was integrated into what Lummi Nation was doing. Um, so next slide. Um, so here are the grants that Northwest Indian College has, replied, uh, has applied for and received um, at the same time. Um, so we've been able to integrate um, our students into the microgrid feasibility studies, both for Lummi Nation and the college. Um, by paying them as interns to work with our contractor to learn the process and be able to take that back to their communities um, and do similar work. Um, we also uh, followed the lead of Red Cloud Renewable um, and applied for funding to build a mock roof and do a train the trainer program at our college. Um, we're not yet NABCEP certified like they are, but we're working toward that. Um, and then we also have done a lot of youth engagement with Lummi Nation School 
Um, we've got solar suitcase kits that we take over to them, um, and I'll talk more about those in a minute. Um, and we also do travel to other um, tribal colleges and reservations with a mobile solar trailer that we have. Um, so we've we've really been integrating um, the workforce piece, the education piece with the work that's being done at Lummi. Next slide. Um, so when I was asked to start the engineering program at Northwest Indian College, um, I really thought about the existing engineering programs at tribal colleges and how typically students end up sort of leaving the community to get a job in what they studied. Um, and I wanted to build a program um, that allowed students to stay in their community and serve their communities. So the program from the start was focused on renewable energy and energy sovereignty um, so that the students can help plan and design the future of their communities. Um, and in parallel, we started building that workforce program so that we'd have the folks to build, install, um, and maintain the systems as well. Um, and what's really great about our systems is, you know, our engineering students learn on the same systems that our workforce systems learn on, uh, uh, workforce students learn on so that um, they really understand the technologies um, and the construction of the different pieces. Um, so it's a very hands-on program and um, hopefully moving toward, you know, being able to train up the designers, the workforce, um, so that tribal folks can do all of the work. And, and the real goal there is to make sure that when that funding is coming in, um, that it stays within the tribe and that the tribe can choose how and what to do um, versus outsourcing everything, which is sort of what happens when people get solar installation grants um, or microgrid feasibility study grants, um, that work gets outsourced. So hoping to keep that money in those jobs um, and, and really being able to have the community make the decisions um, about how it's done and what is done. Next slide. Um, so again, we do a lot of outreach with um, K-12 through Lummi Nation School. Um, you can see there in the center a picture of the solar suitcase kits that we use. Um, on the left there are the um, solar water pump kits that we use in the engineering program and also when we do outreach to different tribal communities. Um, and on the right are uh, kites that we work with um, the NASA Aaron project on. Um, those collect wind data for students um, so that they can look at wind as a resource as well. Um, with those uh, kits in the center, the solar suitcase kits that the K-12 students assemble, once those are put together, um, those are basically a small off-grid kit that can be donated to elders in the community. Um, so those elders can then have something in case of an emergency to have lighting and cell phone charging and small loads like that. Next slide. Um, so our, wor our workforce education um, right now includes uh, solar installation training. Um, so it says in process, but we actually just completed our mock roof and did our first two trainings. Um, so you can see there our second installation training that happened. Um, we have a huge wait list. Um, the first training we trained eight individuals and the second one we had 12. Um, and I still have a wait list of about 15 people who, who want to participate. Um, we've had elders join our trainings, which is just so amazing to see because they're just really excited about solar in the community. Um, so this has been a really great program and um, we have plans to add a ground mount array next to this mock roof and also to incorporate batteries in the future. Um, because of those microgrid feasibility studies, we know that we're going to need battery backup on a lot of our critical buildings. Um, so we're going to incorporate that in the training as well. Um, and we've worked with all the local installers um, to basically say that for any future contract that you have with Lummi Nation, you will bring our students on the roof with you. Um, so anybody who's completed this mock roof training is actually getting access to employment opportunities. Um, and uh, the local installers are looking to hire several individuals. Um, so it's a really awesome program that's actually putting people into jobs. Next slide. 
Um, so in the future, we're again um, planning on adding, you know, battery banks and more solar arrays based on the output of that microgrid feasibility study. Um, another thing that I didn't add here is that Lummi Nation is looking at um, forming a tribal utility commission. So we're doing a study on that right now um, to see the feasibility. And we're also looking at that biosolid site um, for adding additional solar generation and potentially wind um, and just continuing to grow that engineering and workforce um, by adding to the programs and making sure that our students have training opportunities that support the work that the nation is doing um, so that we're able to you know give our students those jobs versus outsourcing all of that funding next slide Um, so that's the Lummi Nation School solar installation, which was our first um, after we started all this funding. Um, so super proud of that and how far we've come uh, since the beginning. So any questions? I think we're now open, opening it up to everyone for all the questions. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, excellent presentation and nice uh, perspective on how you've started from from projects into workforce development and then into educational programs. That's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so with that, we, we do have time for Q&A now. Um, we do have some questions that have been submitted, but uh, you know we should have time for more. Um, so please do submit any written questions that you have, and uh, we'll likely get a chance to, to, to address them. So um, let's get started here. Um, first couple questions we had were for, for John Redcloud, and he is uh, uh, stepped away, so we'll get those questions answered via email with him directly. Um, uh, question for for you, Arash. Um, uh, you showed your your multiple projects on the Navajo Nation, uh, but where is the energy going from those projects? Is that uh, serving the nation, or is it uh, you know sold to outside utilities? Can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, for the for the first two plants in operation, the Kanta plants, that clean energy is being uh, sold or produced on the Navajo, is being used on the Navajo Nation and consumed on the Navajo Nation. For the other plants, the, the one we're building in Utah, the uh, 72 megawatt plant, we are actually selling that energy to communities, communities in Utah, and then the profit and the margin is coming back to NTUA and we're utilizing those funds to electrify homes on the Navajo Nation. And then our Cameron Thank Solar you. Project as well, our, our Cameron Lachie Project will, will be export projects as well, whereby we're selling off the nation and the, the, the funds and the, the profit will be brought back onto the Navajo Nation to electrify homes and keep our utility rates stable. Excellent. Thanks, Raj. Another question, a little bit off topic for you, but um, can you talk about the environmental impacts of large scale utility solar? Um, um, you know, were, were there any major mitigations you had to, to do or, or um, can you just elaborate on environmental permitting? Um, on the environmental side, you know, we, we go through the normal, uh, on the tribal side, we go through the normal um, environmental impact statement and, and, and FONSI process. We have to get biological clearance, cultural clearance, archaeological clearance. Um, I think some of the most challenging overall is the, you know, the most sensitive is to make sure that we uh, recognize all culturally sensitive sites and make sure that we avoid those. And we go through extensive process with that, as well as on the biological side. Um, as far as the actual environmental effects of, for example, a solar project, the majority of the material is, you know, some type of steel or metal, silica or sand and glass. So we haven't seen any, from our studies, any real environmental impact to the area that would cause issues um, in the future when we talk about reclamation or so. I don't know if that's a question, but I just want to raise those two when we talk about the environmental impacts of, of these types of projects. Excellent. Thank you, Rosh. Um, uh, this is a question for, for you, Stephanie. The, the STEM kits you talked about, um, uh, can you elaborate on, on what they were or what they are in a little bit more detail and, and like where they 
were produced or how to, where they come from? Um, the solar suitcase kits, I'm assuming it's that question. Um, I'm not sure if it was the water pumps. Um, I can talk about both. Um, the solar suitcase kits come from a group called We Share Solar. Um, so we, we actually partnered with Remote Energy on a lot of our training curriculum. Um, and they've worked with We Share Solar in the past with those suitcases. Um, so they're basically um, a suitcase sized kit that the students assemble. Um, there's a small solar panel and the students kind of hook up all the wiring um, to make sure that the solar energy goes direct to the little charging ports. And there's like a little light bulb that lights up. Um, so they're just kind of a K-12 friendly hands-on kit. Um, the students get to do the assembly and the troubleshooting and testing of the kit. Um, and then the solar water pump kits are essentially a very low cost um, pump and a bucket from Home Depot and a small solar uh, module. And students basically do a lot of um, testing with digital multimeters with those kits. And they can kind of see if they face the panel toward the sun, they can measure how many gallons per minute get pumped. And then they can do little experiments of blocking part of the panel or turning it away from the sun or turning it you know, toward the ground. And they can take the different measurements to understand how does the solar energy work um, so that they can better design systems. Excellent, thanks, Stephanie. Um, another question for you. Uh, what was the tipping point there at Lummi Nation um, with, the, with tribal leadership? To, to take the, the initiative to uh, pursue energy sovereignty? Um, I think it really was kind of at that community meeting. It was, it was an all day meeting um, where everybody was invited and there was just a lot of feedback from the community um, about you know, being connected to PSE, Puget Sound Energy, or not being connected. Um, there are several people in the community that don't have um, connection to the grid. Um, so that was a concern. Um, but also just being able to um, generate clean energy. Um, here in Washington State, you know, a lot of a large percentage of our energy comes from hydro. Um, and those dams are really impacting salmon. Um, and Lummi being a um, salmon people, you know, who um, basically have survived off of that as a primary food source. Um, since the beginning of time, um, you know, we're like, well, we should really do something to, um, you know, choose where our energy is coming from and being able to uh, control and maintain it. And I think the last point that I'll say is kind of similar to any other tribal community. When you when you have power outages, um, you know, you tend to be the last to get power restored. Um, so that idea of having the sovereignty and being able to do your own generation and um, managing that and making sure that you know during an outage your critical facilities um, are able to be powered and that you're able to um, support the community um, that's really important and you don't really have control over that when you're using the utility excellent thanks stephanie um, another question here, and I think, you know, it's probably directed at for, for you, Arash, but um, uh, are there in, uh, tribal environmental trainings um, that that are needed or, or do you conduct any um, uh, during the permitting process or, um, you know, I guess maybe it's more aligned with and I'm sorry, I'm trying to rephrase it or understand the question, but um, uh, you know, what sort of environmental outreach or tribal outreach is there for, for these for these larger utility scale projects um, uh, to, to the tribal membership so they're get comfortable with the, the environmental side of it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think that's an important question for <clears throat> our larger scale projects. Um, what we generally do, and just I'll just give the overall um, process that we do is, you know, to, when we look at developing a project, um, we first consult with the local community, with a local chapter. They're called chapters on the Navajo Nation. 
and we work with them to identify areas for potential development. Um, they provide us valuable input on cultural sense, culturally sensitive sites based on their history and experience. And um, once we identify an area, what we do is um, we reach out to the grazing rights permittee holders in that area to get permission to build a project, and they have to consent. So we can't, we don't, we don't do eminent domain. We have to actually go to the local permittee holders and obtain consent. Um, once we do that, we've got to get the local community's approval through a chapter supporting resolution, and then at that point, we we can begin the the studies. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, the studies that we have to do is the archaeological studies to make sure there's no archaeological artifacts or anything related to um, to such. Um, we we do the biological. cultural um, biological resource compliance whereby we have to hire a bio um, with tribal lands and trust lands and the area and they complete their study to see if there's any bi there will be any biological impacts um, for the project for the development of the project um, if that's clear we then go on to the cultural resource compliance portion whereby we consult with we have to put under contract a um, a cultural specialist and what their job is to do is they have to be in the field they you know they survey the area they survey the site they visit homes and families around the site and they determine you know if there's any culturally sensitive sites around there um, and that process actually takes quite a bit of time because it's very sensitive when we talk about the cultural sensitivities of each area if they do identify a culturally sensitive area um, we mark it off and as part of our Pro development of the project, we th there's a certain buffer zone that we have to make sure that we we respect um, through the process, and then we go through that. Um, so those are the general studies that we have to go to um, go through. Uh, in addition, um, for many of our projects, we have to get an environment an environmental impact statement study, and we get a finding of no significant impacts for our um, projects on the environmental side. So that is an extensive process. Generally, for the larger scale projects, we've got to get a FONSI. And, um, you know, that's something that just is part of the process overall. So we've got to hit all of those different areas before we can even look at building the site. Um, and then once those are all cleared, you know, the Navajo Nation has been delegated the authority to approve the lease to build the project. We get a lease from the Navajo Nation. And at that point, we can begin the process for, you know, for RFPing out for, for certain components of the project. Um, you know, when you talk about development of, of solar on the utility scale, it is a, you know, you know, you look at Kianta, it was a seven, seven to eight year process. So it's not like we do these projects overnight. It's, it's a long drawn out process. As we've gained more experience, as the nations gain more experience in these types of projects, they've been more expedited because we've got a framework and template to work off of. But, you know, when you talk about just the siting and permitting of a project on the environmental approvals, the biological and cultural, you're looking at at least three three years to get through that process. Um, and, and it's pretty, pretty extensive. So I hope that provides um, some feedback to the participant or to the attendees. Excellent. Thanks so much for the, uh, the answer and the perspective. Um, let's do one last question and close it out. And this is kind of for um, any of the panelists that want to chime in. But from each of your perspectives, what do you see as the, the biggest challenge for increased tri tribal employment in, in the, you know, these future energy jobs um, that, that we've been talking about? And you can just chime in as as, as you're able to or want to this is our this is ours from my perspective i from i think the biggest challenge and we look at it I, you know for i look at it from a holistic level and a, a larger level is that with the status of the land being in trust um, and you talk about workforce development for larger scale, you know, employment opportunities for tribal members. 
the difficulty and challenges in developing anything economically on the navigation on any tribal nation under trust land or commercially um, is a challenge. It's a deterrent. Um, you have to have folks that are really dedicated or business minded folks that are really dedicated or any type of developers that are really dedicated to, for these opportunities. And, you know, it, it, that's a challenge of even providing these opportunities on the na on on a nation or tribal tribal lands. So I think the status of the land is difficult in that it's just difficult, you know, it, it's it's very restrictive in how you can develop, um, at least from my perspective, on on tribal lands and therefore you know, you don't have job opportunities as you would in other communities. You know, you look at example um, from the nation's perspective uh, from a community called Page, Arizona, and there's also a community called Lachii, Arizona. Page is on the state land and Lachii is on the tribal land. You have a great tourist attraction in, in Page with hotels and other amenities and, you know, food places, but on the, the Lachii side, you don't have as much development. And um, I, I think that a lot of it has to do with the difficulties in, in developing on, on tribal trust lands. Thank you, does, does anybody else want to chime in? Is yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. I, I agree with um, what was just said. And I think in addition to that, um, not having a lot of tribal contractors or companies um, to to provide those employment opportunities, um, and and part of that is you know training the workforce, so needing more workforce training in a lot of different areas um, to get kind of a group of folks trained up that could be hired by by a tribal contractor. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, one last opportunity for anyone else to chime in. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll wrap up the webinar. All right, hearing none. I I want to thank uh, all of our panelists uh, for um, for their participation and time today. We really appreciate that, and uh, also our attendees. Thanks for um, you know your interest and in, and in, in spending time with us today. In general, we are very interested in, in any suggestions on how to strengthen the value of these webinars. So please do send us uh, any feedback that you have. Um, on our final slide here, uh, we show the schedule for the last webinar of the 2022 series. This webinar is titled, Tribes Leading the Way to a More Sustainable Energy Future. It will be held on December 7th. Um, and all of our webinars are scheduled for 11 a.m. Uh, mountain time. Uh, with that, this concludes the webinar for today. Thank you again for your interest and attendance, and we look forward to you joining us again on future webinars. Good day.